Hi folks, this is Jay. Oh, you okay? Today we're looking at Philippians um, chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And um, we're looking at the topic of humility, so I hope it's a blessing to you. Let's come before the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, we confess our failure and sin today. We give you the prayers and the glory. And Father God, I just pray that this message will be a blessing to all those who hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you turn to Philippians chapter 2, it says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, be in a full accord of one mind, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others, having this mind in you among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be poured out, that I do not run in vain or labor in vain, if I, even if I am to be poured out a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need for he has been uh, longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill indeed he was ill near to death but God had mercy on him and not only on him but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow and I am eager to send him therefore that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious so receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service. Sorry about this. So... We're looking at humility, and there are three ways to be happy, and that is humility, humility, and humility. I remember when I was uh, a young man of about 20 years of age, uh, training in a church, and I thought the pastor was going to teach me books, give me books to read, or whatever, for the first day, but he didn't. What he did 
was he pulled out a tomato and he says, how do you cut a tomato? And I looked at him and I thought, this is a bit strange. And he said, we all cut tomatoes differently. He said, the thing that you need to realize is people skills. And that's what we need. We need people skills, how to handle people. And uh, that's very important. And here in this uh, passage of scripture, Paul is preparing the ground for people skills because people are not getting on. If you turn to Philippians, um, sorry, uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 16, ja Acts chapter 16, verse 14 to 16, you'll see that it says, The Lord opened Lydia's heart. Lydia was a businesswoman and she was saved by God. Then in that chapter, you have uh, a woman possessed who was um, touched by Paul. Uh, you have a guy who was a, a jailer who came to know Jesus. And so God was working in a mighty way in the Philippian church. And you had these people, you had women in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, who were not getting on. If we turn to that, Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, I entreat Udia and I entreat Syncate to agree in the Lord. So, business woman, possessed woman, uh, Philippian jailer, other ladies, a variety of people in the church. And when God is at work, there will be problems. Because where there are people, there will be problems. It's like children, if you have children. Uh, in a kindergarten, there's going to be problems. And so when there is spiritual life within a church, as a church goes forward and begins to be planted, it will experience problems. And the way to deal with it is in the area of humility. And so I, we have three points, humility in church, humility in Christ, and humility in leadership. Humility in church. Have you ever been hurt by a church? Has a church ever hurt you? Uh, has an individual in a church hurt you? Has leadership hurt you? You can nurse that hurt for years and years, but it'll do you no good. Paul wants you to focus on something else rather than your pain. You say, Jay, you don't know how much pain I've experienced. I've experienced a lot of pain from a church, and, you know, it was, it was not good, Jay. Uh, and you want me to get rid of it? And the answer is yes. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, focus on Christ, it says in uh, Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, Paul wants you to realize the word uh, any encouragement in Christ means come alongside, that Christ comes alongside you, he comforts you, he's there with you. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, that God is the God of all comfort. So why is Paul wanting you to focus on that Christ will comfort you? Well, if you've been hurt by the church, if you've been hurt by a Christian, you can nurse that pain, and that pain can be more important to you than anything else. And Paul is saying, don't nurse the pain, but think about the comfort that Christ has for you, that he loves you. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of you. Think about what Christ thinks of you, what Christ wants for you. He loves you. He'll never forsake you then focus on your spiritual family. It says in verse 2, participation in the spirit. We are one spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, it talks about we are one spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it talks about we are one spirit. What that means is if some a believer hurts you or disagrees with you, they have the Holy Spirit as you do, and therefore they are your family. And so you have to be warm and affectionate to them even though they are unkind to you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, focus on unity. Uh, it talks about uh, unity there. Uh, verse 2, complete my joy of being of the same mind, having the same love, being a cord of one mind, that we're to be united. If we turn to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, with all the loneliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
that is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We are to concentrate on the unity of the people of God. We are to be united in fundamentals, in the belief in the Bible, belief in God, that Jesus is God and, and man, that, that believe that he died on a cross for our sin, he rose again in heaven and hell. We are united together in the fundamentals of the faith. And then we are to focus on our attitude. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, we read, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. We are not to be competitive. We are to look to people with an attitude of humility. Rivalry means being competitive, strife. Conceit means empty glory, that you're thinking about yourself, that it's all about you and your ministry and what you want. But if you turn to 1 Corinthians 15.9, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, it says, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul regarded himself as nothing, and yet God was gracious to him and called him, and we should regard ourselves as nothing. So have we been concentrating on the pain rather than upon Christ? Have we been distant from a fellow brother or sister of Christ when we should still be loving even though they have hurt us have you put your issues above the unity of the church in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 it says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and if we have failed God will forgive us and he will cleanse us so that is the humility humility in the church now humility in Christ. If you turn to 2 Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 18. So I'll, I'll read uh, from this translation. 2, 2 Timothy 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You might be struggling in a relationship with your marriage and you're wondering how it's going to go. You don't seem to be getting on. This is the passage for you. This is the Grand Canyon of theology. When you're coming down a stream and you come to the Great Grand Canyon, so here we come to the Great Grand Canyon of theology, who Christ is. Number one, he is 100% God. It says in Philippians 2.6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Christ was God in the flesh 100%. The Greek there being in the form means unchanged. He was unchanged from the beginning. If you read John chapter 1 verse 1 and 3 it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Verse 14 and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 to 14 if you turn to Colossians chapter 1 this is a passage that the Jehovah's Witnesses quote. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 14. It says, Who is it? The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all create, create cre every creature. Now, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God? That is reference to Jesus being God. But then the Jehovah's Witness said, But it says, The firstborn of all created, or of every creature. That means he was created. No, it doesn't. It goes on, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, or things were cre created by him and for him. That surely says that he is God, and he is therefore all before all things, and by him th all things consist, and he is what? The head of the body, the church, 
it was the beginning. Here it is, the firstborn from the dead. <coughs> so when it says Jesus is the firstborn of every creature, it means he's the firstborn of the dead. It means when he rose, that was the first fruit of the new people of God. Yeah? So it doesn't mean he was the first person ever created. So you've got to be careful. You've always got to check the context. When a cult member comes to you, a Jehovah's Witness or anybody like that, and they quote a scripture, look at the context. <coughs> so Jesus is 100% God. You can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3.16, Titus chapter 2 verse 13, John chapter 8 verse 58. Muslims say that Jesus didn't say he was God, so have a look at John chapter 8 verse 58. John chapter 2 verse 28 says, uh, uh, Doubted Thomas goes to the Lord and says, The Lord my God. And Jesus takes the praise and the worship as of God. So Jesus is 100% God and he is 100% man. In John chapter 11 verse 35 it says that he wept. In John, uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 he says, But made himself nothing, taking upon him a servant, being born in the likeness of man. He was a man. He was a human being, flesh of flesh, bone of bone. And he wept. In Luke 24, 30, the Lord says, Touch me, feel me. I'm not like a ghost. And so our Lord was 100% God, 100% man, but he humbled himself to the cross. He became obedient to the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Philippians 2, verse 8. We read, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. He humbled himself and became and died. And, and how did he humble himself? Well, let's turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. If you would like to turn to Isaiah 53, verse 3, he, despi he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces. He was despised, and we deemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was buried for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and he... With his stripes we are healed. He is the Son of God. God who is in eternity. The mighty Savior. The mighty God. Who came down and became a human being. And now he allows himself to be mocked in a courtyard. Spat at. A crown of thorns put upon him. Carrying the cross. And there he was nailed. The Son of God. For your sin. Do you notice something? He did not grasp to be God. He did not grasp everything that he wanted. He came and he made himself of nothing to die on a filthy cross for the sin of the whole world. And he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the wrath of God fell upon him for you and for me. And what is the cash value of that? Well, if you're married, why are you grasping for your rights? Why, why are you grasping for what you want in the marriage? Why don't you give yourself up? Why don't you make yourself of no reputation like Christ? And there will be happiness in your marriage. And in your singleness, you're grasping for a, a man or grasping for a woman or you're grasping for a relationship. Make yourself nothing. What's it matter in the scheme of things? Live for Christ and live for others. That's what the passage is saying. You're saying, Jay, this is painful. I don't like it. It hurts me. I, I, I need a relationship. Well, my friend, I understand the pain. But you need Christ more than anything, and you need to live for others, and then you will be much happier in your singleness. And if you notice, it says, uh, And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you go to Isaiah 45, verse, I think, 23. Let's go to Isaiah 45, verse 23. Isaiah 45, verse 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, and righteousness shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. This is God saying that every knee will bow to him, and every tongue confess who he is. 
That is an exact quote by the Apostle Paul in Philippians. He knew what he was doing. He was exalting Christ as God. So my friends, in your marriage and in your relationships, think about Christ, what he's done for you. Forget about yourself and think about others. And then thirdly, humility in leadership. We've looked at humility in the church. We've looked at humility in Christ and now humility in leadership. There's a missionary couple that came back from mission work to America. And as they came back, it was the president's inauguration and everybody was praising the president and there was a great big parade and everybody was honoring the president, etc. Well, the missionaries were bitter because nobody came to put a band on for them for all the work they did. And one of the missionaries, uh, the man, the elderly man, prayed to God and God said, you get your reward in heaven. But it's so easy to be doing things in the work of God and nobody's giving you praise, nobody's thanking you and you can then be bitter or you can be upset because nobody's appreciating you. But that's when you have to be humble. It says in verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The word work out your own salvation there is not that you're saved by good works but that you're already saved by grace. The work out your own salvation there means that you daily serve the Lord, you daily discipline your life to grow and God will bless it. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work his good pleasure. Verse 13, God is working in you but you've got to cooperate with God. It's no good sitting back and saying God's going to do it all. You've got to read your Bible, go to church, fellowship with people, evangelize and God will bless you. Take it seriously, be dedicated to it. But then we see three leaders in Philippians chapter 2 verse 17. Paul says he's poured out like a drink offering. In uh, Philippians chapter 2, 19, 24, we have a selfless Timothy who is serving for others. And then in 2, Thessalonians, uh, 2 Philippians chapter 28, 30, we see Epaphroditus, a servant. In verse 25, he is a soldier. In verse 27, he has an illness. And verse 30, he nearly died for the faith. These are people who serve God, not for themselves, but for the kingdom and for their Lord. And God is calling you to sacrificial leadership, a humble leadership. He wants you to stand in the gap for your generation. Whether you're a man or woman, I only believe that pastors are men and elders are men and deacons are men. But that doesn't mean to say that women don't have a role. It doesn't mean to say that women can't lead. In the Philippians, there were women missionaries, women servants of God. And you can be a leader as a woman in your sphere of leadership that God can give you. Teaching women, uh, evangelizing, helping in various works in the church. You can lead. And we are all called to lead in some way. Whether it be leading at home, whether it be leading at work or somewhere, we'll be given responsibility to lead. And as we lead, we're leading not for ourselves, but for God. Jesus knowing that the Father, this is John chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come forth from God, went to God. And he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. And after that he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherein he was girded. He was, uh, Jesus was humble, willing to serve, willing to give himself for others. And that is what he's calling you to do in your leadership. Stop being competitive. Stop being um, controlling. Stop any model of leadership that is not a humble leadership is not biblical so stop it if you want to go high in the kingdom you've got to go low if you want to be a great servant of God you've got to go low Moses was in the desert for 40 years he had to learn to be nothing before he could become something if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 2 Timothy chapter 4 Verse 6 to 10. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is end. I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. 
Paul kept going and serving God no matter what. He didn't have a pity party. Nobody came and said, oh, poor Paul. No, he just got on with it and served the Lord. And that's what he wants you to do today. Irenaeus of Lyons was a was a, a catechumist, a, a catechist who taught uh, theology uh, like like a, a deacon or an elder uh, in Lyons in the second century AD, maybe middle or early second century AD. And the Gnostics spread rumors that the, the Christians had been killing their babies. So Irenaeus was sent to do some diplomatic work to Rome. The bishop in Lyons stayed. The Roman soldiers came in and began to kill and butcher the Christians in the city. They put women on hot iron chairs and heated the chairs up to roasting. When they killed them, they fed their parts, the dogs, and wouldn't let families bury them. A 12-year-old boy saw his family tortured and he still would not recant and still believed in Christ. The church was decimated, the bishop was killed, and it was an absolute butchery what happened. Irenaeus came back from his diplomatic work. The last few remaining Christians there appointed him the bishop. But what did he do? He fought the good fight. He stayed. He ministered to the people. He, he visited them. He taught the word. That's what he did. He didn't back down. He didn't give up. He didn't have a pity party. He said, woe is me. He rolled up his sleeve and he got on with the work. And you've got to roll up your sleeve and get on with the work as a pastor. You've got to roll up your sleeve and get on, your work, get on with the work as an elder or a deacon. You got to roll up your sleeve and get on with the work of your children's work and your youth work and your evangelism. You got to roll up your sleeve and get on with it because it's a great work and important work and needed work. And you're not going to let the enemies of God put you down. So get on with the Lord's work that He's called you to do in humility. The lesson of this passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter three is 1 Peter chapter 5. Let us turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 7. Likewise, a younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. You all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. We all have a Mount Everest of ego. We are all full of ourselves. And God is calling us here to focus not on ourselves but on Christ, not on ourselves but but on the humility of Christ that he made himself of no reputation and to model our lives on that. And then he has called us to lead in a humble way. That's what he's called us all to do. And I encourage you to take that challenge. And if you have failed, God is most gracious and loving. If you turn to Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. We read, But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Christ died for you, gave his life for you, and he will forgive you if you failed. Because he is a gracious and loving God. I failed. I failed over the last six years. I was a minister of the gospel and I was proud. I had a nervous breakdown and ultimately I was full of pride and I needed to be humbled. And God has humbled me these five, six years. I feel I've come back out of exile. I've come back into what God wants me to be and to do. But it's been a long process of humbling and learning to take the discipline of the Lord and to 
to get healing but also to be disciplined by God to realize that we're nothing that we don't deserve anything that whatever God gives us he gives us because it is of grace not because he, he owes, us, owes us it he doesn't owe us anything everything we get from God is his grace his love he is a gracious kind God and he loves us so much that he will not allow us to go on with pride he will not allow us to go on as selfish he will not allow us to go on and on and on being concerned about all about us he will change us and mold us and he will break us in order to make us because he loves us and so my friend thank the Lord for what is in your life that is difficult at this time because it is making you better it is making you draw close to him because he wants you to walk in humility and in love and that's what he wants for you today so let us pray and ask God's blessing upon this message Father God I thank you for your love and your grace and your care and we give you the prayers and the glory today and I pray for your dear children today bless them so wonderfully with your love and grace pour upon them the anointment of your grace and your love shed abroad in their hearts your tenderness Lord comfort them and bless them and use them in Jesus name Amen. Amen. I hope this was a blessing to you and God bless you. I'll be doing a few lectures here and there and uh, take care. God bless you.